welcome to our citizen science talk. Um, thank you so much for coming out. Uh, I'm Linda Fitzhugh of the St. Andrew Baywatch, and um, we are an environmental group here in town, and we work um, really to protect water quality in the bay, protect sea turtles nesting. We do a lot of shoreline um, uh, anti-erosion projects, I should say, living shoreline where we build up uh, shorelines. And, um, and then we also do seagrass monitoring and scallop restoration and stuff like that. So we do a lot of uh, interesting work here. And if you're interested in finding out more about St. Andrew Baywatch, you can come chat with me after this presentation or um, you can check us out at standrewbaywatch.org. And um, I am really, really excited to uh, introduce Kurt Cox um, to you. Uh, Kurt is a Panama City native. He is a graduate of Gulf Coast um, State College. Uh, he's also a graduate of the University of Alabama. Um, he currently works at three jobs because, you know, one is clearly not enough. <laughs> he's an exploration geologist, a freelance writer who publishes short stories in literary and conservation magazines, and is a contractor for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission's Python Removal Program in the Florida Everglades. Now, do you wrestle pythons? <laughs> and he says yes, so um, good for you. I'm glad that you do that. I just, uh, I do seagrass work, which is a lot easier. It's just grass, and it's just in the water, and it just grows slowly. <laughs> sharks, jellyfish. Well, the sharks don't come by in that shallow water. Um, so, I, Kurt I is a really a interesting. Of beaches. I know things. I know Kurt is a are. really interesting uh, speaker. He has a very uh, avid uh, life. I mean, as far as traveling, he's a mountain climber. He does blue water sailing, bow hunting. He does artifact diving. Uh, he and his wife Denise live in the cove, and he has been walking the Panhandle beaches for a couple years now. And he has quite an interesting story to tell you about beach plastic. And so without any uh, further ado, Kurt Cox. Thank you, Linda. Well, first of all, thanks for coming, uh, especially on a rain day. Um, I spend a lot of time by myself out there. And, and sometimes I get a little disgusted with humanity, as you might imagine, on a beach cleanup project. But. Just the fact that you showed up today is going to keep my motor running for quite a while. So I, I, I really appreciate it. Um, let me start off by telling you how I stumbled into this project. It was not my intention. Um, I've been walking the beaches my whole life. But this particular day, I was near Redfish Point. I just like walking the beaches for fresh air and exercise. But this particular day, I saw all the trash along the high tide line. And I thought, I'm coming back here next weekend, probably, if the weather is good. If I pick up this trash today, I won't have to look at it next time. And there happened to be this square plastic container there. I thought, well, this is easy. So I picked up all the trash on my hike that day. Sure enough, the next weekend, that part was clean, but I walked a little further, and there was more trash. So I scrounged around for a grocery sack, and I cleaned that piece of beach. And one thing led to another, and another, and another, and I started walking further and further. And I thought, well, this weekend I'll start my walk where I left off the previous weekend. And in the course of the past three and a half years, I've now picked up over 6,000 pounds of plastic marine debris off of local beaches. Um, Helps to be a little obsessive compulsive. Um, somewhere along the way, I don't know when, I got it into my mind that I was going to clean up every foot of beach of our local beaches. And it evolved into the definition of local was uh, Gulf Bay and Walton counties between Port St. Joe and Destin and 70 miles. And I have done that now. And really three times, because when I clean a beach, I'll pick up the plastic on the low tide rack line, the high tide rack, and then the storm rack. And plus, a lot of these beaches are hard to get to, and they involve long walks, like um, Topsail Hill comes to mind, um, places that are private property, like Water Sound and Watercolor, 
And I always had to walk back to my truck, so that's two for sure. Um, so uh, that red line shows the beaches I've cleaned, and if I zoom in on, on Bay County, I'm also cleaning shorelines along the bay, St. Andrews Bay, East Bay, and Crooked Island Sound. Um, and being a scientist, being a geologist, <coughs> I started collecting data, just part of my nature. And I started keeping a spreadsheet really from day one. I had the date where I was, uh, the hours I was picking up, the pounds of plastic, and some of the more unusual or the most common things that I found that day, as well as a column of photograph numbers where I would take pictures. So I can pretty much go back and recreate how many pounds of plastic marine debris came from how many hundred yards of beach on a certain day. And I've actually had some researchers contact me for some of this information. Um, so plastic, I, the, the reason I was only picking up plastic, well being a geologist I know that glass bottles, although they're unsightly, when waves erode them down into dust it's sand. Glass is made out of sand, it goes back to sand. Aluminum cans, aluminum is a base element. It will go back to being aluminum. Um, but plastic is different. Um, Plastic's a man-made thing, and it's made from oil and natural gas, so it's not really natural to be out there in our oceans. And, and plus, I'm just one person, and if I start picking up bottles, I'm going to be weighed down pretty quick. And some of these, like uh, Shell Island, Crooked Island, I might walk seven miles out and seven miles back. So, you know, a bag full of bottles will weigh me down pretty quick. So that's why I just picked up the plastic. Some of it is really large. This is still out there on Shell Island. This is a paddle boat hull. Uh, one of only three things too big for me to remove, but someday I'm going to get a battery-powered sawzall and take this out. And some of the plastic is really small. This is Deer Lake State Park in Walton County, and you can see the smaller plastics, bottle caps, cigarette filters, balloons. <coughs> and like I, I mentioned, I'm cleaning bay beaches, but it's not just beaches, it's just shoreline. And some of our shoreline is marsh, and plastic is in there. Um, and it's really bad um, because 70% of plastic sinks. So you get plastic bags and foam mattresses and things settle over the seagrass. Well, seagrass can't grow through plastic. So if I'm out there and I'm pulling out a big piece of plastic, there's no seagrass underneath it, and it's a big seagrass bed. So I thought, well, this is doing some good for the seagrass. And I mentioned the, uh, the storm rack line. This isn't on the beach. This is way up in the dunes at Shell Island <coughs> where these old uh, pop bottles were deposited during a tropical storm or a hurricane because um, it's maybe 10 feet above mean sea level. And... Um, some of this plastic, I can actually tell you which hurricane deposited it. Was it Opal? Was it Camille? Was it Francis? You know, go back in time. Um, and, and the storms will put plastic up in the uh, palmettos and the oak trees as well. Um, you know, every new high tide brings in more plastic, but the storm rack, I know once I remove it, it's not coming back that, that next high tide and I'm removing it before the next hurricane can refloat it and carry it back out into the ocean. Um, so some of this has been out there a really long time. Like when's the last time you saw a camera that used film? Uh, when's the last time you saw Garfield hanging from the window of a car? So yeah, we're talking about 70s, that this plastic is still out there. And, and I've kind of developed an eye, you know, and I see plastic that just washed up on the beach versus what's up in the storm rack. The stuff that's been exposed to the sun for a long time, uh, plastics uh, degrade in sunlight. So you can take like a gallon milk jug, or if it's brand new, you pour the milk out, you can almost hammer a nail with it. You surely couldn't possibly tear it in half. I couldn't. Um, but if it sits in the sun, you can take that same milk jug and just crush it between your hands and it's powder. Um, 
So I, you kind of develop an eye for how long this plastic has been in the sun. Um, so I'm picking up all this plastic, and all of a sudden, plastic is hitting my radar when I'm surfing the web, looking at my news feed. And I'm starting to learn about plastic and plastic in the environment. So let me say, I'm a geologist. I'll talk a little geology. I have some expertise there. But I'm not an environmental scientist. I'm not a sociologist. I'm not an oceanographer. So I'm, I'm going to be talking about those things. But I'm not an expert. So if I say, if I state something as a fact, it's really just an opinion. So I encourage you all to do your own research. But what it appears to me, big picture, is we're conducting this big science experiment on the human race. Plastics really haven't been around in any quantity. Well, they really weren't invented until the 40s. and didn't become ubiquitous until the 60s. But like this, this carpet is plastic. Those chair seats are plastic. The chair backs are plastic. Ceiling tiles are plastic. The lamps are plastic. The TVs are plastic. The flag is plastic. This isn't wood. I'm sure that's plastic. Uh, most shirts, I can't find cotton t-shirts anymore. They're all made out of polyester, which is a plastic. Um, I mean, we're surrounded by plastic, and it's only been around a short amount of time, so we're not sure what the long-term effects of all this plastic exposure is going to be. Like, go to the grocery store, and almost all the food is in a plastic container. Well, we're starting to learn. These are, you know, your little recycle codes on the left, one through seven, these types of plastics. And on the far right, someone has identified the uh, human health hazard to certain types of plastic. And some of these that has a high hazard level, like the polystyrene and, uh, and the polyvinyl chloride, are known cancer-causing agents. Well, polyvinyl chloride is all plastics are injected with other chemicals to give them certain properties. Polyvinyl chloride is injected with chlorine and other things. Well, chlorine gas is a, a deadly poison in high concentrations. But that's the soft plastics that like a beach ball is made out of or a shower curtain. You know, if you ever take a new shower curtain out and it smells so strong or a new pool toy and it, that it's degassing these chemicals. So if you're going to buy one of those, before you put it in your home, take it outside for a few days. Um, and polystyrene, these are these uh, clamshell containers that fast food comes in or used to come in. Um, well, it contains styrene, which is linked to cancer and can cause nervous system damage. Um, you might have noticed that McDonald's quit putting quarter pounders in the styrene, polystyrene clamshells and has now gone back to cardboard. You know, this is one of the reasons. Uh, they're trying to get ahead of the curve because uh, cities, counties, uh, states, entire nations are starting to ban certain types of plastic like polystyrene. Um, another example, like Miami Beach, for a while they banned plastic straws just because they were cluttering up the beach. Um, and these are some of the chemicals in plastics. Uh, bisphenol A, BPA, you probably heard about. It makes hard plastic water bottles, like Lexan. Um, it's popular for baby bottles for a long time until it was banned for use in baby bottles. All these chemicals are worse for uh, developing human systems, babies and pregnant women. Um, phthalates are real common in that uh, PVC, the poly polyvinyl chloride plastics. Um, some of them act like um, hormones in the human system, or at least in lab rats. Um, they disrupt endocrine systems, which can affect growth, like they can cause early um, puberty in girls. Um, dioxins are in plastics, which are known uh, source of cancer, styrene. Um, again, one big experiment. So I've done a lot of reading, and at least in my personal life, you know, I'm not an alarmist, but the things that I do is I don't put plastic containers in the microwave because heating it up or freezing it releases those chemicals. Um, 
My wife's aunt had some old depressionary glass food containers. We don't use Tupperware anymore. We use glass containers to store food in the fridge. Um, I try not to use plastic at all. When I go in a restaurant, I automatically tell the waitress, no straw. Um, so the, the title of this talk, Beach Plastic Apocalypse, it, it, it was probably a really hot day. I probably had mild heat exhaustion. But I, you got a lot of time to think out there, right? So I was thinking, I, we're absorbing all this plastic into our bodies. We're not sure what the effects are, but what if it's bioaccumulating in us, especially in our endocrine systems, in our lymph nodes? I thought, you know, zombies are big in popular culture these days, so, you know, they came to mind, and, and all, every comic book or TV show or movie tries to say what caused the zombie apocalypse. And I thought, well, what if in this process of, of bioaccumulating these plastic chemicals, we become, in part, plastic. And then what if we start needing that plastic? Something flips in our biochemistry that we need plastic. And then to take it to extremes, what if we started needing those lymph nodes or endocrine systems out of other humans because they concentrated those chemicals we need? And beach plastic caused the zombie apocalypse. Um, anyway. <laughs> Perhaps. Um, anyway, and, and then of course, then it must spread to animals, and you know the rest of the zombie story. But anyway, that's where my title came from. Um, I collected a lot of data, so I, I, I can say with some authority, after six tons of plastic, who's putting it into our local waters. Let's take a tour. Uh, recreational fishermen, commercial fishermen, this is a lobster trap tag, probably from the Keys. Uh, again, commercial fishermen. These are knives where the handles have rusted away. Uh, five bucket, five gallon bucket handles, Teflon scrapers for fish cleaning boards. Uh, even the uh, Fish and Wildlife Commission, Department of Environmental Protection adds plastic to the ocean. Um, the top half of that picture are lobster tags. Every bag of oyster harvested is required to have a tag put on it immediately. So I found oyster tags, which are coated in plastic, of course from Apalachicola, but also Carabell, um, from Alabama, Mississippi, and Texas, all on our local beaches. And they've got the name of the harvester, and they have to circle which harvest area it came from. So I have a lot of information on them. Then uh, there's the... Uh, Offshore industries, whether that's shipping or oil and gas development, or dock construction, uh, maybe even the military. Um, now these are dust masks, dust masks and earplugs. And it may be a coincidence, I'm not casting blame, but the beach is closest to the mill and the shipyard is where I find most of these. Uh, I wasn't even on a beach cleanup this day. I was surf fishing, and this raft of balloons blew right onto the beach where I was standing. I, yeah, this is not a stage picture. There's my rod. That's where they blew up. And I Googled the uh, logo on these balloons, and it was a grand opening of a restaurant in Destin. And this was on Shell Island. And I emailed the restaurant saying, hey, your latex balloons just blew up, drifted up on Shell Island, which is an important sea turtle nesting area. And sea turtles inadvertently ingest balloons. So they promised me they would have no more balloon releases. Um, every September, the Ocean Conservancy has a worldwide beach cleanup where they give every volunteer a clipboard and a form, and they fill out how many of what kind of items they find. And the top 10 items are here. Number one is cigarette butts. Two is food wrappers, three is beverage bottles, four bottle caps, five straws. And I completely agree. Uh, cigarette butts are the one thing I just get tired of picking up. Uh, the, the worst is the Mexico Beach Pier and Deepwater Point at St. Andrews State Park. I have no idea why cigarette butts accumulate there, but I had a, a volunteer a friend of State Park say he picked up like 
10,000 in a weekend? And, and this, um, you don't even have to throw a piece of plastic into the ocean for it to get there. Uh, I'm sure you know this intersection. This is where US 98 hits Thomas Drive, right there at the flyover at the Navy Lab. Well, this is a storm drain that leaves that intersection, goes underneath the Navy Lab and into the bay. In fact, every storm drain in the county flows to the bay. So you drop a cigarette at the mall, it's going to end up in North Bay. And I'm pretty sure that commercial fishermen aren't allowed to smoke because these are all snuff cans that look really well traveled, and I think that's where these are coming from. There's just so many of them. Uh, bottle caps, check. Yeah, that's in my top five. Um, unbelievable. <laughs> Straws, yeah. Um, <clears throat> this is from Panama City Beach. After, after doing this so long, you could bring me a bag of plastic you picked up off a beach somewhere, a local beach, and I, I have a good chance of telling you which beach it came from. They all have their distinctive nature. Um, like uh, Crooked Island Sound, I call that Mexico Beach because that's where all the stuff from Mexico lands. Um, this is, can you guess, Panama City Beach? Uh, in fact, the densest number of plastic items per square foot is uh, a condo very, very close to Pier Park where I can stand in an area the size of this table and I'll be there for 30 minutes with my little grabber picking up. It's just something about it. Um, and it's actually there at Pier Park is where I started finding tons of rubber bands. Well, latex, like I mentioned the balloons, anything is soft, like a grocery sack is really bad because sea turtles mistake it for jellyfish that they naturally feed on. Um, so these rubber bands really bothered me, but I couldn't figure out where they're coming from. And I know that uh, further offshore, fishermen will take like a, a one pound drop weight for like a grouper rig bottom fishing and attach it to their line with a rubber band so when they get a hit it breaks away so they fight just the fish and not the, the pound of lead. But they don't do that inshore. They don't do that on the fishing pier at Pier Park. So I couldn't figure it out where these rubber bands were coming from until South Walton County I started finding red rubber bands. And this was my aha moment where the guys who rent the umbrellas at the beach wrap them with rubber bands, and when they break, they break, and they must break a lot. There's a collection of latex balloons that I, uh, that I collected. Um, so again, back to the demographics of who's putting plastic in the environment. Well, small children. Uh, Walton County, again, wins the prize for most toy shovels. Uh, bigger kids, babies, find lots of binkies, dogs. Um, some of it is thrown in to the Gulf intentionally. These are all messages in plastic bottles, which you'd think, hey, a message in a bottle, well, that's kind of cool, right? Until you've opened a bunch of them, they're insipid. <laughs> Like, why do they even bother? Um, for a long time, this was an organized activity on cruise ships where they would gather everyone on the Lido deck and have them write a message, put it in a bottle, and throw it in the ocean. And I can tell some of them are just that, where it's like, hi, how are you? I'm Zeb. Okay, bye. Really? So I think your parents are trying to get rid of them for an hour. Um, rarely are they interesting. A lot of them I don't even open anymore. But, but nowadays, they're really cracking down on plastic being intentionally put into the ocean. And nowadays, if a cruise ship catches a passenger intentionally throwing plastic overboard, that passenger will be put off on the next port. That's how seriously they're starting to take it. Um, these are all uh, pieces of uh, fireworks displays. I think this one came from the Rosemary Beach display a couple years ago. Um, a lot of aerial fireworks are advertised as being uh, biodegradable, all cardboard and gunpowder, but they're being sold a bill of goods. 
because yeah, you can see that a lot of this is cardboard, but there's a lot of plastic in there too. And, and it looks like three mil plastic trash bags, heavy black uh, trash bag-like material that's obviously been blown to bits coming out of these aerial displays. So, um, yeah, Fourth of July is when we celebrate our independence by intentionally shooting plastic into the ocean. Uh, the 5th of July is a really big beach cleanup day for people who clean up beaches. In fact, Walton County has an organized event every 5th of July if you want to get out there. And if you do shoot plastic into the ocean, at least go out on the 5th and, and pick some up. Um, Valentine's Day, sure, it's, it's represented in beach plastic. As is New Year's Day, or New Year's Eve, rather. Easter, yeah. People hide eggs in the sand and then can't find them. We even got Mardi Gras. And because Bacchus is a uh, New Orleans crew, I'm pretty sure this floated here from, from Louisiana. Uh, got Halloween. Christmas. Spring break. Where the handies out for free. And yeah, about that time of year, they start washing up. We got weddings. Um, and with names, places, and dates, it's real easy to Google a picture of the blushing bride and groom. But that's how I know this koozie came from Key West all the way to Panama City. Besides the weddings, we've got funerals. You can read that. It says B&L Cremation Systems. So this plastic box once contained someone's ashes who was buried at sea. And I guess the uh, container got away from whoever was pouring them into the sea. But it still takes me a while to wrap my mind around the fact that it was someone's last wish to the, add to the ocean's burden of plastic marine debris. Now, this was another memorial that washed up on the beach. Now, these are real flowers. I'm like, hey, real flowers. That's a nice memorial. Throw that out onto the surface of the ocean. But these uh, flowers are tied together with a dollar bill. And if you didn't know it, our paper currency has red and blue plastic fibers in it. OK, this is a, a plastic airplane that washed up on a Tyndall Beach, coincidentally. And it was really well traveled. Uh, its entire surface is covered with the bites of marine animals, uh, mostly fish. And and I've kind of developed an eye for how far plastic has traveled. You can tell by the amount of sun degradation it's seen, the amount of uh, marine growth, algae and barnacles, especially the gooseneck barnacles, which don't grow locally. They're out there in the, the deep gulf. Um, and because it's an airplane that says Army on it, I'm pretty sure this came from Mexico. But then I find things that aren't plastic, this big hunk of aluminum found on a Tyndall Beach still had that tag on it that with a part number, so I could Google it, I identified it as an aileron of a T-33 jet, which I reported to Tyndall and their security office was glad to know about. Um, and not all the plastic is locally sourced. I've told you I found it from, from Key West to uh, Galveston, Texas. Well, in in the solid green are the continents. That's land surface. Um, and all these arrows are ocean currents. And basically, they all flow east to west because those are the trade winds that are pushing water all the way across the Atlantic and the African coast to us. Um, this is South America. And you can see that everything is heading to the Caribbean. And it squeezes between the Yucatan Peninsula and Cuba, enters the Gulf of Mexico. And you see how those arrows go right up toward the Mississippi Delta in Louisiana, and they bifurcate, and they either go toward Panama City or toward Texas. And let me simplify this. Um, now, that Yucatan current forms the Florida current, and once it passes through the Keys, it becomes the Gulf Stream. And what's labeled as the loop current is a current that only forms in the summertime. Um, and all that, everything that's being carried by these currents in the summertime will get a lot closer to Panama City. 
In the summertime is the only time you see the sargassum washing up on the beach. Uh, that's because it lives out in the Gulf Stream, out in the blue water. But in the summer, that loop current moves very close to Panama City. Fishermen love it because it brings in a lot of fish that otherwise live 200 miles offshore to within 50 miles of our shore. But along with the sargassum comes the beach plastic from the Caribbean. Um, and just to prove it, now I have a little bit more expertise with rocks. And these are rocks that drifted up on our beach. And you're like, what? Say that again. <laughs> these are rocks that drifted up on our beach. And I'm sure many of you know that uh, this type of rock is called pumice that is ejected from volcanoes into the air where it traps air bubbles and it floats. And these all came off local beaches. The biggest one there on the left is bigger than a football. And there are geologists who can uh, put these in uh, special uh, lab equipment to tell you the exact composition of these rocks and type it to one particular volcano that it came from. Well, in the Caribbean, anything up current of Panama City, there's not that many active volcanoes, but there they are in the Windward and Leeward Islands. So those rocks came from the Eastern Caribbean all the way to Panama City. So I know currents are carrying stuff from the Caribbean. Uh, sea beans, if you're familiar with what sea beans are, these are kind of nice to find. A lot of people put them in rock tumblers and make jewelry out of them. Uh, they only grow like in uh, Central America, Costa Rica in particular, on vines. They don't even grow near the ocean, they grow inland. So a sea bean has to drop off that vine, go down a river into the Caribbean and float the tides to Panama City. So stuff is coming from that far away. Um, and there's a whole field of oceanography that studies things that float on the ocean, uh, trying to figure out these currents and how they move during different seasons. Um, well, there's a couple famous incidents in the North Pacific where a tanker was delivering sneakers from China to the west coast of the US. And they got in a storm, and all the sneaker containers went overboard. And then again, it happened with rubber duckies. And it was a discreet event, and the captain logged exactly where they went overboard. Well, six months later, they started washing up on beaches between California and Alaska. And there was even a, a website that tried to match sneakers so people would have a left and a right. Well, this oceanographer based a whole study on it, these ducks and these sneakers called flotsometrics. And uh, in the North Pacific gyre, it's an ocean current that circulates. And one year after these dumped into the ocean and started drifting ashore, they came ashore again. And then there weren't any. Two years later, here they come again. And then there weren't any. The third year, here come these rubber duckies and sneakers again. So using this plastic, they were able to determine that one complete circuit of the North Pacific gyre took a year. Um, since then, they've run plankton nets through the North Pacific gyre, and they're finding twice as much microscopic pieces of plastic as they are plankton. It seems to be accumulating plastic that's coming out of the uh, rivers of, of Asia. Anyway, back to the Caribbean. Um, plastic that I can identify its source, I found plaster from Venezuela, uh, Honduras, Mexico, Cuba, the Caymans, Haiti, Dominican Republic, um, all of those. Uh, these are butter tubs from Haiti, and they're not uncommon. Um, coincidentally, the brand name is T. Malise, which means Ant, malice. <laughs> um, but anyway, I, after finding these, I thought, how, why? Well, it turns out in Haiti, a common practice is to, uh, for the garbage trucks to dump their load on the beaches at low tide, and at high tide, out it goes. And then they do it with the same thing the next day. Uh, this is a shampoo bottle that came from the Dominican Republic. Again, all this landed on Panama City beaches. This is a spice bottle. H.O. in Cuba, made in Cuba. These are quart oil containers from Venezuela. These are uh, the caps of five-gallon jugs of water, which are real common with uh, 
commercial fishermen who go offshore for weeks at a time. And these are, this is a Mexican bottler, and the brand name is Planeta Azul, Blue Planet. Ironic. And these you, you won't find in any local store or any American store, to my knowledge. But uh, with those summer, the show, when the sargassum shows up, this shows up. These are real soft plastic, and it's rare for them to come ashore without turtle bites taken out of them. They've been out there. They've crossed the entire Gulf of Mexico. And these soft-sided plastic containers are about this long. Uh, some of them are labeled, but they hold condiments, mayonnaise, mustard, ketchup, vinegar. And this is my furthest traveled piece of plastic, uh, where the front and back are labeled in both Arabic and French. So how many countries are, are dual language in Arabic and French? Well, it suggests to me it's a former French colony somewhere in North Africa, right? It kind of narrows it down. All right, so that's Morocco, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria. Um, but the problem with most of those is their waterfront is on the Mediterranean. Well, no current comes out of the Mediterranean. I didn't know this for a long time. All the currents go into the Mediterranean. All the tide goes in and it never comes out. That's because evaporation in the eastern Mediterranean keeps up with the amount of water pouring in. So only Morocco has an Atlantic shoreline as well. Well, the star brand of, of table salt, I <laughs> Google searched and, and uh, yeah, it's made in Morocco. It's the only place it's made. Now, I'm not saying it was thrown into the ocean there, but it was very well traveled. It could have been on a tanker or something, but um, this is something that's required to be posted on, on every uh, boat over a certain size anywhere in the world. And it's an international treaty where we all pledged uh, not to discharge any plastic at any time, at any distance from shore into the ocean. It's against the law to throw plastic into the ocean. Uh, my brother went on a sailing trip to the Bahamas and knowing my interest in the subject, he sent me this picture. Um, he says that every windward shore of the Bahamas has this incredible amount of plastic washed up on it. And just for something to do, sailors will make impromptu sculptures out of it. And then my two nephews decided to bring me a grocery sack sample of plastic from the Bahamas that caught their eye. And, you know, nothing out of the ordinary. Fishing lure, a piece of a fish basket, a couple of net floats, a doll, but then three ping pong balls in this very small sample. And I don't think I've ever found a ping pong ball on the Panama City beach. Um, so I'm curious. I, this is where we're here for a citizen science lecture. This is a little bit of sociology. It turns out that the national hobby of the Bahamas is ping pong. Um, this popped up on my news feed one time, and the catchy title was, Why You Can Take Bali Off Your Bucket List. This is the most famous beach in Bali. And the pictures you see are usually up there where the chairs are. And, they're, and all you can see is the chairs and the ocean. And you can't see what's below the chairs. And that's what it looks like today. That's what it looks like every day, the most famous beach on Bali. So this beach plastic, as you can imagine, is going to have an impact on, on tourism as well as the environment. It also affects uh, marine life. I've already mentioned the habitat damage to, um, to seagrass. You know, you get these you know, 40-gallon barrels just sloshing in the wave and just mashing up the, the seagrass. But it also is ingested by marine life. This is a, a plastic cup, and note the very distinctive diamond-shaped holes in it. Well, those are bite marks. And there's only one animal I know of in the ocean that makes diamond-shaped bite marks, and those are sea turtles. And this cup, where it's bitten, has really sharp edges. And I thought, you know, how many of these little diamond-shaped pieces of sharp plastic could I swallow before I had to go to the emergency room? So imagine what that's doing to the guts of a sea turtle. 
Again, those diamond-shaped bite marks is a well-traveled piece of plastic. And it seems like the longer it's been out on the ocean, the more likely it is to have been nibbled by marine wildlife. This is a bait cup that must have had 10 or 15 bite marks taken out of it by a sea turtle. And the problem when they eat, the, the worst is the latex and mylar balloons because when they start eating a jellyfish, jellyfish are slippery. Well, their mouth and throat is designed to grab something and not turn loose. And as I understand it, when they swallow, take a bite out of a plastic bag, they can't spit it back out. Even if they then realized it's not food, they have no choice but to swallow the whole thing. And that can plug their guts and cause them to starve to death. This is a single day, and every piece of plastic you see, from the jug to the Ziploc sandwich bag to the shoe sole, has sea turtle bite marks taken out of it, along with my least favorite thing to find on the beach, a dead sea turtle. Uh, I do report these to the Fish and Wildlife Commission. If they still have flesh on them, they like to do autopsies to see what killed them. There's a five-gallon bucket with uh, several shark bite marks on it. That's a pretty good size shark. This is a random piece of plastic so eaten up, you can't tell what the plastic was or what's been eating it. But the problem I'm getting at is this plastic in the ocean is getting into the food chain. If it's getting into the fish, well, it's getting into us. I, uh, I mentioned that there's more microplastic in the North Pacific than there is plankton. Well, all the plankton feeders, whether they're Whales or squid are consuming those microplastics. So it's getting into the food chain. And things in the food chain tend to bioaccumulate toxins. Uh, this was in the News Herald last year where they had rescued the sea turtle. They took it out to a Gulf World and they had to amputate a limb where the circulation was cut off by kite string. And I went through pictures of my collection, I thought, kite string? Yeah, I got kites, kite string, kite string holders, check. Anyway, the sea turtles, marine mammals, seabirds, they're finding out pretty much all of them have plastic in them or wrapped around them. One thing I haven't read about, but it's just my observation, is, is the bay beaches, which are not white sand, but they're kind of muddy sand or mud. I just find them shingled with plastic bags from gallon size to 40 gallon size to, to blue tarps. And there's so many of them and they get covered up by the sand. You know, I'll tug on one little corner and it'll turn out to be a piece of plastic the size of that table. And there's so much of it that I know that burrowing organisms like uh, marine worms, invertebrates of different types are traveling through that mud to feed. And by doing so, they exchange oxygen throughout that mud, and it's, you know, it's a complicated ecosystem, and maybe that has an impact on seagrasses too. But you're basically coating that bay mud with an impermeable barrier. I, you know, the fiddler crabs can't burrow through this stuff. So what impact is that having that we don't even know about yet? And because 70% of plastic sink, the deep oceans are just getting paved with plastic. You know, what's that gonna mean in the big picture? Uh, there is limited recycling of plastic, but it's sort of a hoax in that, like say water bottles, even places that do recycle, even say California, who take the recycling very seriously, less than 1% of 1% of plastic water bottles are recycled into new plastic water bottles. To be recycled, they have to be sterile perfectly clean, perfectly collected, perfectly sorted, and that just doesn't happen in the real world. When you see a bin that says recycle plastics here, it should really say downcycle. What happens in practice is they take number one, number two plastics, and they melt them down and turn them into number five and number seven plastics. These are uh, dock boards made out of recycled water bottles, which ironically, the dock got torn up in a tropical storm and still ended up on the beach, even though someone recycled their water bottles. But eventually, when you downcycle, that means, it doesn't mean the plastic's kept out of a landfill, it just means it's delayed 
getting to the landfill. Because when the type 7 plastic is done with, it goes to the landfill. Uh, this is a, a bait cups, one that's fresh and one that's been degraded in the sun on its way to turning into microplastic. Uh, from a distance, this beach looked like white sugar sand, right? But it's much of it is a uh, styrofoam, either ice chest or, or shipping containers that have been broken down into individual balls, which is what you're looking at here. Uh, this was a recent find where this is a bean bag chair, which are common for uh, deck furniture on boats, on recreational boats, went overboard. And all the bean, bean, beans in the bean bag chair, well, they're not made out of pinto beans anymore. They're made out of styrofoam balls. But it was leaking out. I was able to collect most of these up before it went out into the bay. Um, I, now these are plastic items, but there are also other things uh, that I pick up when I find because they don't belong in, in the ocean. Uh, bottom right are a couple of mercury switches. These are for um, bilge pumps, so they do contain mercury. And again, these, all these things are destined to be degraded by the sun until the mercury is released. Um, top left is a, a circuit board for those uh, Mylar balloons that sing happy birthday, but it's got a, a computer chip in it which contains heavy metals. Um, various other things like a memory card for a camera, uh, I find a lot of oil containers, and they're not all empty either. A lot of them still have oil in them, which I will pour into a big container and, and recycle. But I find transmission fluid, coolant, brake fluid. It's all out there just, um, <laughs> just waiting for the, for the plastic to be breached. Um, in fact, recently, um, oh, in case you're wondering, I've got a, a Facebook page called Beach Plastic Apocalypse in my most recent post was a, a, a liter container of weed killer, weed be gone, where the top half had been degraded by the sun and had breached, so it all leaked to the spill point. I was able to pick it up carefully and pour half of the weed killer into another bottle before it emptied into the seagrass bed, which was only 10 feet away from where I found it. Um, medical waste, sure, I find that. Um, these fluorescent tubes, as you probably no contain mercury, and I'm pretty sure these are commercial fishermen that when they burn out, they just toss them overboard. A little tricky to get these back to the Steelfield Recycling Center, the, the county solid waste landfill site in West Bay where they'll take these fluorescent tubes and properly uh, dispose of them. This picture I call shells on Shell Island. So again, uh, a slightly hazardous thing, especially some some kid found these 227 rounds. Now this five gallon gasoline tank will still have three gallons of gasoline on in it when I found it. And then a five gallon bucket, you can't see it, but it's got a collection of um, metal cans of varnish, shellac, paint remover, and, and the lids had all rusted away but the chemicals were still in there, and that was on Smack Bayou, where it was hidden in the palmettos. And it's only a suspicion, but I think one of those liveaboard sailboats who liked to anchor in Smack Bayou uh, had done some deck work and then hid the chemicals he didn't need in the palmettos. Um, I love beach combing, and I do find useful stuff. Um, I haven't bought a fishing lure since I started this project. Um, Insect repellent, sure, uh, soap, uh, swim goggles. Kids in, in the neighborhood don't have to buy those. I hand them out, snorkels and masks and rope and dock bumpers. Uh, so, yeah, there's useful stuff to be found out there. So uh, I don't want to preach to you. Uh, I would just say that the things that I have done from learning from this project is... Uh, Simple things that we can all do, and that's one, to use less plastic, especially the single-use plastics, like a styrofoam to-go cup or a plastic straw or plastic fork. Just, just try and say no. Um, you know, this is my water bottle, so I don't have to take a, take a plastic one. Besides the health reasons, 
you know, if we can stop it at the source, that's really the only long-term answer to keep plastic out of the ocean. Um, and then when you're out there enjoying the beach or fishing, you know, a lot of this stuff isn't put in there on purpose. It's an accident. So I'm just saying, be more careful, control your plastic, don't let, let it get away from you. And yeah, I've lost stuff. I've lost fishing lure, fishing line, but I kind of figure, well, I've got this karmic debt. Next time I'm out there, I'm trying to pick up at least that much, plus a little more. And that's my third thing. Next time you're at the beach, you don't have to do a big beach cleanup with a 40 gallon sack, but, um, but, but if you do, people will ask you to take pictures of their group for them. <laughs> I get a lot of requests. Hey, can you take our picture? But um, even if it's a grocery sack, or even if it's just the Mylar and latex balloons, you're going to do some good. So I'm going to end with a picture of a beach that doesn't have any plastic on it. Because a clean beach is a safe beach. No plastic, no zombies. Now let me show you a, a brief two-minute video, and then I'll really be done. Just... Uh, show you uh, the tip of the iceberg of what 6,000 pounds of beach plastic looks like. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions in my thing? Let me get the. Thank you. The short answer is every single user group of the Bay and the Gulf are adding to the load of plastic, every single user group. Um, now, we'll give credit where it's due. <coughs> I can hardly source any plastic at all to Tyndall Air Force Base. 
So if, if every other user group followed their best practices, we're going to go a long way. Um, but there are no exceptions. Uh, it's, it's coming from uh, people who live on the bay, residences, recreational users, commercial users. It's, it's really everybody. The, specifically, the, the plastic bags on the beach, most of it's plastic grocery sacks, which means just ordinary folks. Um, but some of the bigger trash bags, you know, are probably commercial users. And in fact, some are those large blue tarps, those large brown tarps. Uh, a couple of them have had a crab trap buoys all along the margin, and they're used far offshore as fish attractors. You know how mahi-mahi like to get underneath a piece of floating trash? Well, people put big pieces of floating trash out there on purpose to aggregate the mahi-mahi and then go catch them, and I find those. Um, but it's, and a lot of them, a lot of those plastic bags are um, like potato chip bags, uh, candy wrappers, um, and you think a lot of the, um, like the potato chip bags, they seem like they're metal foil kind of, but they're not. It's called metalized plastic foil. So there's a layer of plastic and a, and a layer of metal sandwiched together, and with time it's just plastic, but it's, it's everybody. What'd you do with your 6,000 pounds of plastic? Well, for the first couple of years of this project, you know, all around town, various places there, they had the recycle bins out. And, and I would sort the clean plastic from the stuff that's covered with barnacles and algae or filled with sand, and I would bring the clean plastic to those recycle centers. But they, um, they quit doing that, and, and now I just put it in the trash. Um, if I come up with a real heavy section with a lot of aluminum cans, I'll pick them up and recycle them. Um, and I mentioned recycling oil, so I'll recycle or dispose of properly what I can, but plastic goes to the solid waste site now. Well, I want to thank you for not only sharing this with us, but picking up 6,000 pounds of plastic. I think maybe St. Andrew Baywatch, we need to start organizing, you know, several uh, more cleanups. We do work in, I think, September when we uh, do the, yes, yeah, so we do the coastal cleanup. So um, we'll send out emails if you want to help us uh, on that. And that'll be in September at some point. I think it's the third weekend. Of, I'm not 100% sure, but we'll send out emails and, and get that out. That's fantastic. But maybe we need to start doing a July 5th cleanup or something or a few well, days after point. July 4th. That's my point. This entire project, because I didn't hear about it or because it didn't fit my schedule, I've only been on one organized beach cleanup, and that was at the state park a couple years ago. So I think they're fantastic, but I'm saying don't wait for one. Just float your boat. You want to do some good, get some fresh air and exercise, and maybe find something interesting too. Just, just don't wait for an organized yeah. event. Just go to a beach. Well, thank you again. Thank you, Marissa.